So I'm interested in a lot of stuff other than just, you know, basic cholesterol and blood pressure because there's a lot of uh, aspects of medicine that I don't think we spend enough time talking about because when we do, it does tend to translate into a better human experience. And one of those things is this concept of mindful living, and I'm going to touch briefly on that, but maybe, maybe one evening we'll kind of have a discussion about that. Um, but part of mindful living involves sort of paying attention to stuff and being present. And I have a little story to tell you about what happens when people are not present. And it's a story that I have to read. This is the only thing I'm going to read to you tonight, so don't, don't think you're going to be read to for every year. But this is a story that I have to read because I can't leave out any detail. So. It involves a Minneapolis couple who decided to go to Florida to thaw out during a particularly icy winter. We wouldn't know anything about that. Mm -hmm. They plan to stay at the same hotel where they spent their honeymoon 20 years prior. Because of their hectic schedules, it was difficult to coordinate their travel schedules, so the husband left Minnesota to Florida on a Thursday with the wife flying down the following day. The husband checked into his hotel, which was equipped with in-room email access, so he decided to send his wife an email. However, he accidentally left out <laughs> one letter in her email address. And without realizing his error, he sent the email. Meanwhile, somewhere in Houston, a widow had just returned home from her husband's funeral. He was a minister who was called home to glory following a heart attack. The widow decided to check her email, expecting messages from relatives and friends. After reading the first message, she screamed and fainted. The widow's son rushed into the room, found his mother on the floor, and saw the computer screen which read, To my loving wife, subject, I've arrived. I know you're surprised to hear from me. They have computers here now, and you're allowed to send emails to loved ones. I've just arrived, and I've been checked in. I've seen that everything has been prepared for your arrival tomorrow. <laughs> Looking forward to seeing you then. Hope your journey was as uneventful as mine. P.S. It's sure hot down here. <laughs> so anyway, um, is there a uh, an event? Let's see. Probably this works. Okay. Oh, so. Um, so uh, this is the art and science. So you know er everything we as physicians uh, ought to do for patients must have its feet held to the fire of scientific scrutiny. Science is sort of our compass. And we do things for patients, recommend things for patients, because science tells us it's the right thing to do. There's reason and rational uh, science behind it. So, you know, the questions become, what is the science about lifestyle choices that affect issues of cognitive decline? How do relationships affect our health as we age? How do we stay happy? So, uh, there is four groups of uh, social groupings of people that are the longest lived people. And these folks, uh, two of them are from the uh, sort of Middle Eastern Russian cradle area. One is from South America, and the Okinawans are from, you know, uh, uh, Southwest Asia area. Uh, and I forget which of the first three is from Ecuador. I think the Hunzins are from Ecuador. Uh, but anyway, we can learn a lot from these people. And this has been well discussed. And if there's one book you read this summer, this is a terrific read. This is the blueprint for how we age without having to see a whole lot of me. And that's a good thing. If you don't have to touch base with the healthcare system, that's really terrific. So John Robbins, who is the son of Irving Robbins, Irving started Baskin and Robbins. So John is a remarkably good writer. He's a wonderful man, and he's written this really terrific book called Healthy at 100. So this is a real good read. So unfortunately, as we age, over the age of 85, 50% of folks actually suffer from some measurable amounts of dementia. And it's so common that we actually, unfortunately, begin to think of it as normal. And I'm going to tell you, it's not normal. Dementia is not a normal consequence of the aging process. Uh, and when I say the HVOA cultures, that's the uh, uh, the uh, uh, 
all those guys whose name I can't now recall, thank you. Uh, but the HVOA cultures, those are the longest living groups. And it's extremely rare to see that in these groups of folks because uh, they just simply are, they grow old and they're active and they die suddenly. And chronic disease is not known to these peoples. So there was a remarkably interesting study that was reported back some 14, 15 years ago now uh, in the archives of neurology uh, that looked at uh, people over five years and showed that if, we're, if they were physically active, that cuts the rate of dementia in half by simply being physically active. And the benefit was even seen with light to moderate exercise. And it does not need to be marine boot camp training. It can even be water-based activity that minimizes uh, stress on joints that can uh, bark at us as we grow older. Uh, similarly, another article was reported in the Journal of the American Medical Association in 2004 that showed that regular exercise helps preserve clear thinking, even at advanced age. And the difference has been seen with little as two hours of exercise per week. The sweet spot is six hours of exercise per week. And it didn't have to be like, you know, one hour a day for six days and you take Sunday off. It can be three, ten minutes here or there. If it adds up to six hours over seven days, you hit the mark. Another article, men who walked two miles per day had half the rate of dementia uh, compared to those who, folks who walked considerably less. And also with exercise, there's increased memory retention, improved learning scores, boost in attention. And the mechanism of that benefit, you know, there is uh, increased blood flow to the brain. There's an increased number of actual blood vessels called capillaries. Uh, there's a possible increase in new brain cells, and there's also boosts in neurotransmitter levels. So these long-lived folks, what do they eat? That'd be kind of good to know, because you know, uh, food is our fuel, you know, and and what we eat really is sort of important because we would not, if we had a um, gasoline-powered car, we would not put diesel fuel in. That would be a problem, and vice versa. If we had a diesel-powered car we would not be putting gasoline in because there's going to be a problem. And the human body's kind of similar along those lines. So what this slide does is it looks at what um, a typical Western diet, what, what Americans eat, compared to what the Okinawan elders eat. And by the way, of those four groups, the Okinawan elders are the superstars. It's not an unusual to find you know, 108, 110-year-old folks that are culturally aware, uh, cognitively perfect, really terrific. They're remarkable. Um, uh, they age so gracefully. So if we look at meat, poultry, and eggs, it's 30% of the American diet and only 3% uh, of the Okinawans. Dairy, 23 versus 2. Fruit, 20 versus 6. Hmm, that's kind of interesting, isn't it? Yes. Um, vegetables, 16 versus 34. Grains, 11 versus 32. Soy foods, less than 1% uh, and 12%. And fish, 0.5 and 11%. We go back to fruit and vegetables. You know, we think, we think fruit and vegetables are, are healthy, but there, there's a, a little sinister side to some fruits. There's, there's, there's also a sinister side to some fish. We'll, we'll talk about that. But if we compare fruits to vegetables, uh, you, we kind of want to gravitate more towards the vegetables. And it's principally due to the concept of fiber. You know, fiber slows down the absorption of the food, which results in less of a spike in our blood sugars. Uh, and we tend to see more fiber in vegetables compared to fruit. The fruits that have the most fiber are the berries. And blueberries, uh, in particular, have lots of good parts of them such that uh, there's, uh, there's actually some very interesting research going on about blueberries and uh, its uh, favorable impact on health. So, so fiber, fiber's a key thing. Uh, one thing about fish, so there's two aspects of fish I want you all to know about. Um, one fish we should just not eat is tilapia. Okay, and why is that? Tilapia has more of the omega-6 fatty acids compared to the fatty fish that, that are heart healthy they have much more of the omega-3s. So omega-6, not as good. Omega-3, very good, okay? So tilapia 
uh, not only has more of the omega-6, but tilapia is farm-raised, and farm-raised fish aren't as good for us as non-farm-raised fish for several reasons. One, they're genetically modified. When we start monkeying around with the nucleus, the DNA, sometimes we get these unintended consequences. Uh, and, and there's pretty important concerns going on now about genetically, genetically modified uh, foods and so forth. So, so uh, that's especially true um, with uh, the salmon population. You know, wild salmon's better for us than farm-raised salmon. Although, if I have to have the farm-raised salmon, you want it from um, Scotland, okay? Because they, they have almost an organic approach to farm-raising their salmon, unlike what we do here in the States. Uh, so, that, that's an, an interesting comparison between uh, us and uh, the long-lived folks. So, uh, let's talk about what goes on, uh, the difference between whole foods and uh, processed foods. Well, whole foods, you know, when I say whole food, I mean you buy it, it's a whole food. It's like a zucchini or, you know, a acorn squash or spaghetti squash, which is really pretty good stuff. So, a whole food as opposed to processed food. Processed food, people are touching it and doing stuff to it. And the biggest example, you know, the easiest way to remember processed food, if it's handed to you through your car window, it's really processed, okay? So, and the opposite is when you go to the farmer's market downtown on Sunday and you get some stuff which is picked at the peak of nutritional flavor uh, and, and uh, antioxidants. So what antioxidants do in fresh food, food is it neutralizes free radicals. What's a free radical? Free radical is a molecule that floats around in our bloodstream with attitude. And the attitude is not a good one, because what the attitude is, it wants to hurt us. So there is this lining of our blood vessels. Uh, think of it as like a Teflon lining. If the Teflon lining of our blood vessels are healthy, then even when we have high levels of cholesterol, cholesterol is going to bounce off the lining of the blood vessel and not get on in there. But if the lining of our blood vessel is not particularly healthy, if that Teflon coating, we call it the vascular epithelium, if that is faulty, then those cells actually sort of dry up a little bit, they wither, and they pull apart, and they create spaces. And that allows the cholesterol molecules to get in there. But when the vascular endothelium, or the Teflon coating, is healthy, these cells are tightly knit together. And it's really like an impenetrable wall. So whole foods, neutralize these free radicals which injure the vascular endothelium, the Teflon coating. And we see it in stuff you can get at farmers markets uh, all the time. It lowers not only incidence of heart disease, but cancer and macular degeneration, a very important part of the uh, what affects the quality of our life as we age. So uh, the antioxidants neutralize the free radicals, this is the same slide. Um, yeah, okay. So let's talk about uh, weight and Alzheimer's dementia, Alzheimer's senile, senile dementia, we abbreviate ASD. A uh, 21-year-old study, um, so part, as part of my um, background, I, I do general cardiology and I, I'm very interested in prevention because every time prevention beats treatment. And prevention comes in two flavors. Primary prevention, somebody doesn't have the disease and doesn't want it. Or secondary prevention, somebody has the disease, don't want it to get worse. So prevention is really, I think, the best medicine has to offer. And unfortunately, we have been running around sort of taking care of illness and sickness with the advent of understanding public health policies uh, that have increased longevity. So 1900 average life expectancy was age, was age 47. And now it's uh, almost 80 years of age. So what was the biggest impact in the 20th century that uh, improved our lifespan? Was it a pill? Was it a procedure? The answer to both those were no. It was not a pill or procedure. What it was was the recognition of how tuberculosis was transmitted from person to person. So as a public health maneuver, 
they went in and they took people that had tuberculosis, they basically took them out of society, they gave them a nice place to live, these places in the country which were sunny and fresh air and so forth, but basically took all the infectious cases and isolated them so they weren't going to infect, uh, infect their neighbors. So uh, this is an important maneuver. It's public health policy and knowledge of, of, of um, what we can do to promote health. But we're moving away from fixing the diseases to really redefining ourselves in terms of the medical profession and focusing on, instead of being disease treaters, what about being health promoters? Because a nice bang for that effort is, yeah, if you prevent the disease, you don't have to treat the disease. So every patient I see in my cardiology office, I, I ask them two things. Do you get a flu shot every year or do you see the dentist? And why is that? It has nothing to do with anything I do. But some, perhaps the most two important questions I can ask my patients, as well as, hey, do you have, uh, do you have good emotional support in your life? Because those three things turn out to be incredibly important and helpful. And again, it's not a pill nor a procedure. Uh, but when people get the uh, flu shot, less likelihood they're going to get the flu. And if they don't get the flu, they don't have to turn on their immune system. When we turn on our immune system, we fight the infectious agent through inflammation. And anything which turns on inflammation makes us vulnerable to heart attack and stroke. So if we minimize inflammation, that, that's, that's a really good thing. Got off the track here a little bit, but, um, but the point I was trying to make is we're, we're at a paradigm shift in medicine. We're going away from being disease treaters to health promoters. And we believe that's really good on a lot of counts because the way our trajectory now, the American healthcare system, is in big trouble. And I'm going to talk more about that in, in a moment. Um, but uh, getting back to this study, when folks were um, able to have a healthier weight, uh, they dramatically uh, cut their risk of dementia in half. Um, if those folks also had hypertension and high cholesterol, uh, the risk of carrying an unhealthy weight uh, was six times higher than people that didn't have high blood pressure, high cholesterol. The things that encourages Alzheimer's disease meat, fat, cholesterol, sugar, and white flour. So none of those things by and large, well, you're going to find some meat at the Bangor uh, farmer's market, but uh, you're going to find grass-fed products there as opposed to factory raised meat. Uh, but you're not going to be seeing a whole lot of cholesterol, sugar, and white flour. Again, what they do have there is whole foods. Uh, what uh, also discourages uh, this is uh, this is uh, Alzheimer's disease, fresh vegetables, fruit, whole grains, legumes, DHA and EPA. That's what's, those two things are the omega-3 fatty acids. So um, fish are uh, really uh, terrific because they have uh, both these. A lot of times people ask me, hey, I don't want to take, um, uh, I don't like to eat fish. I don't want to eat fish capsules. I'm going to take... Um, land-based omega-3s, um, and is that good for me? Uh, the question, uh, the, um, the problem is no, because we need an enzyme in our body, and only 1% of us have that, that allows us to convert flaxseed into um, the omega-3s. So uh, unfortunately, flaxseed doesn't help us. So I want to talk a little bit about um, how our relationships affect how we age. And the social scientists have given us a lot of information. And you know, as I said earlier, the, you know, one of the three questions I ask my patients is, do you have good social support? Um, because we know it affects health. And here's what the science tells us about it. There's a study done of 86 women with uh, fairly advanced breast cancer. Uh, and this was uh, reported well over 10 years ago. And they, they broke the group down into 43 and 43. Half the group had usual care. And the other half of the group had usual care plus a support group. And the support group met once a week. And they talked about what's going on, how you feeling, how's it going. Uh, and they were sort of shocked by realizing that the survival in the support group therapy uh, was twice that of 
the control group. They're going, oh, this is, this is a small study. This must be some mistake. Uh, let's, uh, let's see uh, if there's any other studies that support that. So in 1993, another uh, report came out, uh, patients with a different uh, issue, malignant melanoma. They were stratified to the usual care plus usual care and support uh, therapy. Usual care only had three times the risk of death compared to the other group. British Medical Journal, 752 men followed for seven years, found that those with significant emotional stress at the beginning of the study had tripled the risk of dying. Just emotional stress, divorce, loss of job, uh, death of a spouse or child. Um, if, however, there was a dependable web of intimacy, people in their lives they could count on, there was no increased risk in death. Married men live much longer than unmarried men, uh, and this is one of the reasons. So this, this comes from a report some years ago called the Hammond Report. And, and it looked at premature death rate in 100,000 men. And they looked at smokers versus non-smokers, whether you're married, single, widowed, or divorced. So, you know, there's a couple of interesting things in here. Um, married people died less than single people. Uh, and when you lost a spouse, either through death or divorce, uh, it's not good because it really impacts uh, survival. You know, if we look at the risk of dying prematurely, a divorced, non-smoking man had a risk of death similar to a married smoker. So being divorced as a man remarkably increases your risk akin to being a multi-decade smoker. So this emotional support system, we don't talk about enough because there's something of substance there that's really important. And you know, as, as we look to become health promoters, we're really going to need to understand all of these things because we need to stack the deck for success for our population. Because if we don't, you know, right now our gross domestic product is 19% that we spend on health care. And that's rising. Uh, and as our population ages, that expenditure is going to increase. There are a few things that can collapse civilization. But one of the things is to have a sicker and sicker population supported by a smaller and smaller group of people because that can't sustain itself over time. So we need to have this out of the box thinking about how can we stack the deck for success. So one of the things I'm trying to do in the cardiology community is to call attention to these issues because we simply need to. And it's for good health, uh, all without pills and procedures, which is my favorite con. So another study out of the American Journal of Epidemiology uh, looked at 7,000 adults on the concept of social connectedness, meaning they had people that they could count on and interact with the disconnected, people who didn't have that, died at three times the rate of connected individuals followed over nine years. So, you know, going from this initial study of 86 breast cancer uh, patients to multiple studies of multiple thousands of people, uh, this social connectedness, this uh, web of emotional intimacy is really important. And this I found very interesting, that the unhealthy but socially connected actually lived longer than the healthy but emotionally isolated people. So it's really good to interact for me with you folks and you with each other and all of us. This is a good thing. We're all, I'm getting healthier by the second year because I'm not eating dinner at home. Um, but anyway, uh, so 17,000 Swedes in this study, if they were lonely and isolated at the beginning of the study, four times the death rate uh, compared to people that were not. Lack of emotional support, the greater risk factor for disease and death and smoking uh, talked about. So I love the CAST trial for a bunch of reasons. One is the cardiology trial. CAST stands for Cardiac Arrhythmia Suppression Trial. You know, we all get palp whether we know it or not, we all get palpitations. We used to think in the uh, ancient days of cardiology of 15, 20 years ago, oh, they're really, really bad. So we would try and make them go away. And we always thought that was a good thing. But unless you really 
test something scientifically to see if what you're thinking is true or not, you don't really know for sure. So the, the CAS trial looked at this concept of, hey, uh, let's try and put people on whatever medications were necessary to try and suppress their palpitations and let's see how they do. They're going to be better. So they took a group, a whole bunch of people. These are people that had a heart attack. Okay, so they broke them into two groups. One, they kind of used drugs to suppress the palpitations. The other group, eh, not so much. We're just going to kind of see how they do over time. And they're going to serve as a control to this group. Double blind, placebo control, meaning the patients didn't know whether they were getting drug. Doctors didn't know if they were getting drug. But there was a data safety monitoring board. And the trial was going to, supposed to go on for X amount of years, but somebody threw the red flag up in the air, they called the timeout, and they go, the study is over. And that piqued our interest, because whenever they stop a study, it's usually for a very interesting reason. So they stopped the study because the people in the active treatment group had a much higher incidence of sudden cardiac death. We were killing them. So that wasn't good. So, uh, but some other things came out of the CAS trial, uh, besides how we look at palpitations. Um, yeah, so um, it's interesting that they did some other things. If the patient had a dog, I think I hear one now, actually. Um, uh, that's, that's a great red tail. Uh, unless the patient had a dog, uh, the patients, those patients, yeah, so there was an increased incidence of cardiac death in the treatment group, unless the patient had a dog. And those patients had one sixth of the likelihood of dying. So, hmm, what, what about that? Um, and actually, that study through the University of Pennsylvania has been sort of shown to be true. If you they asked you one question, you're admitted to the intensive care unit for whatever reason. Do you have a pet? Yes. Those people had a much higher incidence of surviving to leave the intensive care unit. Uh, the BHAT trial, beta blocker heart attack trial, 23 men after heart attack. Do beta blockers help? The answer was, yeah, yeah, they, they, they kind of helped somewhat, uh, but social connectedness offered a much greater benefit than the medication being tested. Um, women with heart disease, triple their risk of disease progression if they were in a stressful relationship. So let's talk about bad relationships. Good relationships are good, but bad relationships are bad on our health. Um, and if women kept quiet about being in a bad relationship, their risk of uh, disease progression rose fourfold. So, you know, the question of uh, what's love got to do with it? Um, you know, the question is uh, what's health, what's happiness, how are they related? So, you know, we're, we're talking, we're trying to become now health promoters. So, what is health, really? You know, so I look at it with these four things. Health is a combination of physical, emotional, spiritual and social well-being. And when all those planets align, that's a healthy person. Now, notice what's not in there is a bullet point that says absence of disease. Some of the healthiest people I have met have pretty significant diseases. Some of the most remarkable people I've ever met have pretty advanced diseases. Uh, but they're healthy. They're healthy in a way of really enjoying the texture of the fabric of their human experience. And what about that? Why am I interested in this sort of stuff here? So this looks at life expectancy from 1850, this is really tough to read here, 1850 to about 2000. So who, who are these lines here? Well, you know, those people in Canada, they don't spend much on health care. And you gotta wait forever to see your doctor. So they've gotta be probably somewhere down here. Well, no, it turns out they're, they're a bit better than us, okay? Um, you don't wanna be an African-American male because our life expectancy, their life expectancy is not so good. But just showing that, you know, to a country that spends a whole lot less on healthcare, they, they really uh, have outcomes, at least as measured by longevity. Uh, to be actually quite good. This is a startling slide, and this should disturb all of us. This looks at when we die relative to when we should have died. In other words, it's one thing, so if average life is expectancy is 79 and I die at 78 and a half, well, okay, well, that's, that's too bad. But it's a whole lot different than if I die at 50, okay? So what this looks at is that concept. How old are you when you die? 
and how, how many lost years did you lose? So you want to be real high on this list. You don't want to be low on this list. So this is women on the left, men on the right. So what's the first country? This is really tough for you. It's Japan. Okay, well, we got to be close. We got to be top three. All right, let's see. Spain. Luxembourg. Well, we got to be top five. Switzerland. Sweden. Greece. Italy. Iceland. Germany. Australia. Austria. Norway. Korea. France. Ireland. Nep Where the heck are we? Next to last. One step above Hungary. Why is that? Why is that? So maybe we're not taking enough medications. <laughs> I don't have to convince you folks of this, but this is a study that looked at, at least for the issue of taking statin medications to lower cholesterol, of those people who ought to be taking statins that don't, you know, the question is, uh, who leads that list? Well, we take more pills than any other country on that list. We are the most pill takers on that whole database. Uh, well, maybe we're not spending enough money. And so this looks at life expectancy versus how much money you spend per person. So and there is this general trend, but I don't know if it's really a trend. It looks like, sort of like a uh, bullet pattern to me. So where are we in this mess? Well, to no surprise, we are spending more money than anyone else on health care. And our outcomes are where they are. So this is not new information. Time Magazine did a whole big piece on the sorry state of American health care. And this was in December of 2009. Um, so if we are not underutilizing pills and procedures, uh, why are our outcomes as bad as they are? This is not how we ought to walk our dog. Okay, this gets back to the issue of physical activity. Uh, and if we look at, I don't like the word obesity. Through my training in uh, healthy weight uh, management, we look at it as struggle for healthy weight, but it's on a lot of these slides. But something happened from 1991 to 2008. And, and this is the incidence of folks that struggle with healthy weight. It went from a rare thing to a pandemic across the United States. And there's a reason for that, and we're going to talk about that. Uh, taking this concept to the theater of the absurd is a chain of restaurants in the desert southwest called the Heart Attack Grill that serve literally only these products. These burgers, which they call single, double, triple, and quadruple bypass burgers, Fries in, uh, that are made in cure lard called flatliner fries, extra caffeinated uh, soda and filterless cigarettes. Uh, this is all they sell. Taste worth dying for. And uh, they're apparently successful. Um, we do lead, unfortunately, the world in the incidence of struggling with healthy weight, uh, more so than anyone else. Um, the um, Intraheart study was a study of over 30,000 people on six continents. It's really a, a biopsy of the world experience. It looked at um, what causes our risk for heart disease. And 95% of the heart attack risk were actually linked to factors of nutrition and the decisions we make on a daily basis. And Dean Ornish, a, an author and internist from the West Coast, Essentially, the, the disease that kills the most people each year worldwide and accounts for the single largest expenditure of healthcare dollars is largely preventable by essentially making different decisions on a daily basis. So, this is an interesting concept. Society asks us to work hard for today so we can enjoy tomorrow. Except, of course, that tomorrow becomes the new today. And we have essentially evolved or maybe devolved into human doings rather than human beings. We fret about the future. We painfully uh, think about the past. And in that way we live, we become separated by the only true thing we have. And that is the present moment. 
And I think there's a part of us that realizes there's this disconnection. You know, I, I got that painful stuff in my past. I, I, I don't know if, you know, my nephew's wife is going to divorce him or it's the future and the past and it pulls us and we're never present unless we really work on it. And when we do work on it, we, get, we can get to a more comfortable place. It's my feeling that because of this void that's in there, we want to try and heal ourselves. Each one of us has an intuitive physician that resides within us that knows what's good for us. And, you know, they, they try. Um, but the easy way to fill a void is with substances, with food, with casual relationships, or the numbing tonic of overwork. Um, and of those, the most socially acceptable one is food. Um, food is all around us. There's few things that we enjoy doing three times a day as much as we do. Uh, and food is, food is one of them. Uh, and we, we need to eat. Um, so um, if we look at a slice of uh, American life, 66% of us own a home, 13% a second home. There's more cars than drivers in the United States. The self-storage industry, which basically exists to store our stuff, generates $17 billion a year, more so than what Hollywood generates. The United States spends more on trash bags than 90 countries spend on everything. Everything. Trash bags. So uh, the social scientists tell us that, you know, despite this abundance, the life satisfaction scores are rather flat. Uh, Daniel Pink uh, is a uh, uh, well-known author. The most striking feature of contemporary culture is the unslaked craving for transcendence. Transcendence, take me somewhere else. This is not comfortable where I'm at. And candles, as people, the social scientists tell us, that candles are a way to do that for the, for the moment. Um, you know, our postmodern culture, the sound bite, the saturation of imagery, CNN, the Weather Channel, ESPN. We can, remember, uh, I remember as a kid, The Wizard of Oz came on once a year. Yeah. It was around the holidays. And you had to be at the TV. And if you weren't at the TV, you never saw the Wizard of Oz. Uh, this constant technological connectivity, the speed of our modern culture. So a wonderful Irish uh, uh, poet, actually, John O'Donoghue, who actually just died of a heart attack. Modern cultural forces are lethally efficient in exiling people from their own spirit. We're evicted from the center of the landscape of our hearts and imagination. Our lives are built on superficial imagery but have little depth. So with that sort of biopsy of like where we are as a country, the healthcare situation as it is, okay, well what can we do about this? Can we maybe focus our direction that complements uh, you know, pill, pills and procedures are important when we need them. When the science says there's robust benefit for the patient, I'm all for it. But we have to have that robust benefit. But what about maximizing some of these other things that will allow us to have, hopefully, a healthier population and minimize our need for pills and procedures? So, you know, these are sort of reasonable questions to ask. Where does happiness come from? From within, without? Can we cultivate it? How's the brain work? So. This is sort of an important thing to talk about, the progress principle. Much of the happiness that we experience comes from a little molecule called dopamine, which shows up in what are called the synaptic clefts between an axon, axon and the dendrite, which are the connections in the brain. These are like little fuses. And the axon and dendrite, dendrite are like right next to each other. And when we're, when we're happy, uh, dopamine is secreted by one and picked up by the other. And when that happens and this happens, oh, we put a smile on our face. It's a good thing. These are positive brain neurotransmitters. And when we feel, when we're feeling happy, we got lots of things, lots of them going on. So we experience these during a process of goal completion, often much more so than the finish line. That is why, you know, everyone gets excited about the holidays and the holidays come and it's all this build up and, you know, parties and get togethers and sing alongs and it's over. Oh, what happened? Uh, I'm not feeling all these brain transmitters. There's a lot of crap I got to clean up in my living room and all the people I had. So it's different afterwards than before. Okay, 
So, so it's this it's this reality of goal completion which is really important. Every patient who I've had the privilege of looking in on after they crest over the age of 90, because I think it's just a good number, uh, I ask them the question, okay, you are the most long-lived, wisest, most experienced people on the planet. Tell me the answer to the riddle. Is the secret of life the journey or the destination? And no one has yet to tell me, oh, 90 is the best. You can't wait till you get here. It's just so terrific. Of course, everyone says it's, it's the journey. But... You know, part of that thing earlier when I said, hey, you know, uh, uh, work hard for today so you can enjoy tomorrow, those sort of things butt heads with each other, don't they? Because we're, we're kind of, you know, work hard so you can really enjoy it when you get to some place, and then you get to some place, and then you're like, wow, 90, you know, well, you know, so, so we ought to sort of look at that, you know, Shakespeare sort of had that kind of going on, but... Um, Go back to Shakespeare. Shakespeare said... Things won or done, joy, soul, lies in the doing. Uh, so the bar kind of had that figured out well. So we're, on, we're talking about how the brain works, progress principle. We get this dopamine bursts as we're getting towards goal completion, and it sort of falls flat at the end of goal completion. But there's this concept of adaptation, and this turns out to be really important because um, of this. A uh, study was done, um, Journal of Psychology looked at what happens to somebody who's won the lottery and looked at what happens to somebody who becomes a quadriplegic. Okay, if anyone here, um, you know, if I had to ask you, you know, all of our hands should be going up saying, yeah, we'd rather win the lottery than become a quadriplegic. But what happens to life satisfaction scores to the quadriplegic one year after he or she became a quadriplegic, and the lottery winner one year after. And it turns out their life satisfaction scores are virtually identical. How could that be? So it has to do in our brains with this concept of adaptation. You know, uh, the really, really fun things, uh, the best meal you ever had, you know, the really wonderful fun things in life are not sustainable over the long haul. Because remember I was telling you, like, you know, the axon pops out, burps out dopamine, and the dendrite picks it up, and when that happens, it's an all good, wonderful thing. Well, if the axon starts making, it starts flooding the brain with dopamine, there's dopamine all over the place, the dendrite goes, well, wait a minute, I, I can't do that. So the dendrite begins to what are, what's called down-regulate the dopamine receptor. So we cannot sustain intense passion in the brain long term. We just cannot do it due to molecular downregulation of the dopamine receptor. So um, that turns out to be why the lottery winner who was like, oh, this is the best, you know, I can help my friends, my family, I don't have any other financial worries, you know, you know a week later they're taking out the garbage and, you know, they got to take the dog to the vet. You know, it's still everyday life happens. Um, and the, the, uh, so they go from the highest high back towards the norm, so the negative slope to that line, downward trajectory. The, the quadriplegic has had everything taken from them. They cannot go to the bathroom on their own. They can't go anywhere on their own. They can't do a thing for themselves until they discover that, yeah, blowing in a straw, I can operate my wheelchair. I can turn on the audio book in my computer. I can teach people what's happened to me, and I can get some benefit. So their trajectory is upward. So the adaptation to life events in our own brain and the trajectory from that, it really affects us and it affects our health. So it turns out that happiness, if we're going to try to cultivate happiness, to minimize our need for stuff that isn't very healthy, it's highly heritable. Uh, there's this concept in the, the uh, social science literature of the hedonic treadmill. Uh, and asks the question, you know, if you strive for more, does it make you happier? Does more stuff make you happy? And, and the answer, the psychologists tell us, no. Uh, the Stoics from uh, ancient Greece and Buddhist philosophy say, look inside. Um, and can we cultivate happiness uh, from inside? You know, if we talk about two people, Bob and Louise, Bob is young, he's single, makes a 
good bit of money, he likes to go to museums, he's good looking. Louise is 65, she lives in a snowy state, she makes less money, she's an um, overweight African American woman on dialysis. And it turns out, who's happier here? It's Louise because she's active in her church, she's highly socially connected, and Bob is a little bit of a social misfit and is not really um, interactive much with people. But Louise is, and, and she is uh, much happier. So the psychologists have given us this formula about how you can actually measure happiness, and we can use it to begin to cultivate happiness. And this is the happiness formula, where happiness equals S plus C plus V. S is your set point. That's what you got from mom and dad. So if mom and dad were happy, odds are you're going to be on the happy side. If mom and dad weren't, odds are you're not going to be so much. But if you add C and you add V, you can actually begin to cultivate that. So let's talk about C. Uh, what conditions can we develop in our lives that's going to help us be happier, you know, especially as time passes? We've talked about the impact of those social connections. They're clearly the strongest. Uh, love relationships, uh, very important. Voluntary activities, uh, seeking this concept of flow and engagement. Uh, flow is we're, you doing something that you enjoy so much, time is, time is you have no concept of it. You, you, it's, I can't believe it's that hour. Right? And it's, it's one of those things where time stands still for you. Um, that leads to engagement in life. Things that negatively affect our happiness, noise, a long commute. How much do I love living in a state where the evening news, morning news has no traffic reports? It's great. Where I came from, we had 450,000 people in our little county. And the counties in Pennsylvania are not the size of Maine counties. They were little puppies. Um, so we had lots and lots of people. Lack of control. You are told what to do all the time. Uh, you don't have any ability to sort of change your conditions. Quality of your relationships. This is a um, fascinating uh, slide for me. Uh, being the father of a 16-year-old daughter especially. But what this looks at is love intensity over time. And so my daughter had just spent the week in Boston at a conference. She is between her ninth and 10th grade. And so she, one of her teachers nominated for a leadership conference and she's very happy to go and you know, I'm getting all these texts about all these cute guys, not about you know the content of the program, and so. But anyway, um, it's teenagers. Uh, it's okay. So anyway, in relationships, and this is all relationships. There's this once there's the chemistry, whatever that is, we get this big peak of love intensity. And why is this happening? Well, you guys know because there's molecular downregulation of the dopamine receptor. You guys are so smart on this. You guys, you're going you're gonna to impress your neighbors, I'm telling you. So anyway, dopamine says, no, 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 we're not going to sustain this. So this happens everywhere, every time, to everyone. Okay. So uh, there is this downfall of the dopamine receptor. And so danger point is here. Eh, maybe he's not so cute, my daughter would tell me, two days after meeting him. Uh, real danger point over time. So this is six months. So this is about four weeks. That's about right, you know, for freshman in high school. Um, so then, you know, it sort of happens. But so what's this black line here? This is something else which turns out to be more important. This is what's called companionate love. And companionate love is the thing that really sustains us. So that first frame of reference was six months. This is 60 years on the bottom. Notice how sort of this crazy passionate chemistry stuff sort of, you know, it flares like a bonfire and does what bonfires do. But in successful relationships, the companionate love rises dependably, slowly, but fully over time. And these are successful relationships. This is less dependent upon those neurotransmitters it's more dependent upon our higher cerebral centers. But this is, this is what's healthy and sustaining. So what about work? Well, I'm, I'm thinking most of you folks are retired. But I know Mike and Amy and I are not. So 
we're going to listen in particular to, to, to this slide, but you all have probably have kids and, and uh, whatnot and people you care about. Uh, work itself is what we deem it to be. So there's three different types of work. There's a job, there's a career, and there's a calling. And um, I have folks go to this website because it can help them sort of try and find how you move up from a job to a career and then ultimately a calling. Because you know, the calling is that thing that you would, truth be told, do for no pay at all. Because you think it's important, you have passion for it, and it's the right thing to do in, in, your, in your brain. So, what if I told you there was a new pill that decreases anxiety, increases contentment, self-esteem, trust, increases memory, it's all natural and free. And if you order tonight, I'm going to throw in Ginsu <laughs> steak knives or something. So, but this is the concept of mindful living. And, and mindful living was developed at the University of Massachusetts over 35 years ago by John Kabat-Zinn, who still uh, heads the, uh, uh, their institute. And there's a, uh, there's a terrific book which comes up in a little bit here that, that goes over this. But there's seven foundational principles of mindful living. And I kind of, this, this is sort of a discussion one evening all by itself. But the idea, uh, let's talk a little bit about um, beginner's mind for one. You know, we tend to walk into a room with a preconceived notion of, I think this is going to be good, bad, or indifferent. I tell my kids that nothing in life is ever as good or as bad as you think it's going to be. It's going to be somewhere else. But I ask them to try and remove those attachments because if you go into a situation thinking it's going to be bad, odds are, you know, it might well be bad because you just have that sort of thought about it. If you go into thinking something that's good and it's not as good, then you wind up being disappointed. But if you walk in with the idea of, I'm going in here with no judgment, and I'm going to be authentic, and I'm going to sort of be myself, and I'm going to let this event speak for itself, uh, that, that can sometimes be sort of relaxing in a way. The idea of patience is also important. You know, if a child comes along and finds a butterfly trying to emerge from its chrysalis, the child may want to help, often to the butterfly's detriment. The butterfly can figure it out. You know, the horse giving birth in the field to a colt knows what's going on. You know, much of those sort of natural things in, in the world happen on their own timetable. But uh, John, in his work, goes through these things which such, with such remarkable eloquence. There's also one of John's uh, uh, trained physicians in Bangor, and we're really lucky to have her. Her name is Mary Iyer, and she, is, she works with PCHC. Uh, and Mary uh, is a practitioner of uh, mindfulness-based stress reduction. And it, it, she does a really terrific program. Uh, this is off the uh, Mayo Clinic website, uh, and MBSR, Mindfulness-Based Stress Reduction, has been shown to help um, with allergies, anxiety disorders, asthma, binge eating, cancer, depression, fatigue, heart disease, high blood pressure, pain, sleep disorders, and substance issues. And certainly, um, uh, the state of Maine could uh, use all its help in uh, substance issues, as well as all these others, because it affects all of us that live here. Um, so part of, part of mindfulness-based stress reduction is the idea we got to do something to get to a healthy, healthier place. And it begins to sort of rearrange that sort of construct in our heads. That instead of doing, 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 why don't we be? And why don't we immerse ourselves in the present moment and be and, and breathe? And when folks come to MBSR with an open mind, uh, really remarkable things can happen. So uh, a couple of resources about mindful living are these books here. The Happiness Hypothesis by Jonathan Haidt. Um, Flow is the name of this book, um, and look at that poor guy's last name. Imagine going through life with that, um, and the way that's pronounced is Sheiksamen Hai. Um, 
And these two uh, last books, Full Catastrophe Living by John Kabat-Zinn, was published originally in 1990, um, is sort of, and he, he uses the word catastrophe not as something terrible, but as poignant enormity. And uh, this, this book, I, I knew its power when our oldest, who is now 24, she was at Gettysburg College in uh, seven, eight years ago, whenever that was. She was doing a semester abroad, and she says, Dad, you're taking me to uh, Europe, and uh, we're going to see a little bit of Europe. I hadn't been to Europe before. And then uh, you can go home, and I'm going to do my semester abroad. My, my daughter's prone to a little bit of anxiety. So, okay, I figured that'd be a good thing, bring her over there, get her situated. And I uh, didn't get quite to the airport, and I started getting the first, first test. Dad, I'm, I'm a little anxious here. Uh, so I said, um, go into your... Uh, Go into your um, purple suitcase, and you're going to find a book, and I want you to read chapter two tonight. And she read that, <clears throat> and she uh, not only became, she changed her major, she was a psychology major, changed her life uh, you know, for, for the better. And I can't tell you how many patients that I believe it has helped. And also, the relaxation response by Herb Benson. So Herb, Herb's a former trainer of mine, I'm proud to say that. Herb is... Um, uh, still uh, the chairman of uh, Harvard's Mind Body Medicine Institute, where I met him. I did some training there. And he's a cardiologist. So, you know, him and I are hitting it off real, real well. So, he's actually uh, one of the pioneering researchers that came up with a type A personality, sort of back, you know, and then with type A, type B. Um, but in this really small little paperback book, which runs about $6, uh, it still continues to be a national bestseller because he teaches the reader how to. Uh, develop the relaxation response. We all know the stress response, the near-miss car accident. Boom, 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 your heart's pounding like a mile a minute. Um, but, you know, if all of us went and played miniature golf for a month, we do this for an hour a day, and, you know, however, whatever our scores are now, odds are in a month from now, we're probably going to be a little bit better. So he takes the reader and asks the reader to practice five or ten minutes a day, these sort of things. And we did it within actually a 10-day training course. You can evoke the relaxation response. It's the thing I use to help me get to sleep. It's sort of my ambient. I can, I can fall off to sleep rather quickly with, with uh, learning the techniques that Herb talks about. And they're not very complicated either. So th these are real good resources that can sort of um, help, help us. And sort of just a finishing slide here for you tonight. I stole this practice philosophy from a really smart cardiologist down at Yale, Harlan Krumholtz, who's a really good guy. And he wrote, and I don't think in two sentences this could be said any better, the highest quality of care is when the patient chooses the path that best fits their values, preferences, and goals, and we've made sure the decisions are not a result of ignorance or fear. So that second sentence puts a lot of burden on me that I need to teach my patient about the disease state what causes it, what's its natural history, how we may look to alter that. Uh, so I just wanted to finish that uh, with that tonight. And so, you know, I think what we talked about is, you know, our U.S. healthcare system is really, a, it needs to be at, at a fork in the road because our current trajectory is in not a very good place. And it's my belief that pills and procedures have their place, but what we in medicine haven't done enough of, but we need to do more of, is give uh, the, the due uh, uh, audience to the things of social connectedness, how we can get to happier places without pills and procedures, how we can cultivate that. Some of these books that uh, I've shared with you towards the end here are real good blueprints. This was a very rough overview of, of something we could talk about for a long, long time, but. Uh, you guys were great. Uh, you, uh, everybody stayed awake and uh, you did really, really good. So, a uh, few minutes for uh, thoughts or questions. You did a fabulous job. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Sir, yes. You know, uh, I've heard about this, uh, this neo feedback. Say if somebody is really stressed, they listen to uh, something, they have the earphones and so on. And I've heard for some people it helps a lot. Have you heard any experience about that? Yeah, so biofeedback's been around for a long time. And for the right person, 
it can be really terrific because our brain is indeed connected to our body, so the mind-body connection is very, very real. And it's actually, you know, one of the things that Herb talks about in his book, not necessarily with earphones and music, but in a way of how to sort of, the, the social scientists call it cognitive restructuring, how you look differently at a situation. And when you look differently at a situation, and then you begin to use some of the tools he teaches you in that book, you actually change your, your biochemistry and your bloodstream, and you can get to, and that's basically how biofeedback works, is you learn how to change those nerve receptors. So yeah, there's actually uh, pretty decent science behind that. Is there anybody around here doing that? Um, you know, I don't know the exact answer, although the main center for holistic care, which is uh, downtown across from the Discovery Museum, um, they would be a resource for that. They seem to have some interesting uh, things going on there. So Can you say that again? This main, what is Maine, it? I believe it's called the Maine Center for Holistic Care. It's right across the street from the Discovery Museum. It kind of reminds me, uh, at Hudson they had a uh, film and it was advertised about people that had uh, Alzheimer's uh -huh. dementia. And they found out what kind of music they liked. And they had the earphones. And yeah. The, I think they said iPod or something. Yeah. And it turned so many of them around. Some of them even started dancing. And before that, they were just like a steering to space. Right. Yeah. yeah, you know, they, they say so. One of the interesting things that Harvard does for kids with warts on their feet, you know, so warts are caused by a virus. And most warts, will go away in time when our body makes the antibodies against the, the antibodies against the virus. And what they do at Harvard is, you, you know, you can cut them off or freeze them off. They both, that hurts. And you don't want to do that to a kid. They actually use hypnosis for kids. And they've got about a 70, 75 percent response rate for hypnosis for uh, warts on kids' feet. So. You know, that's pretty cool, you know, to, to be able to somehow interact with the human brain to convince it to make a chemical compound which kills the virus that's infecting the feet. Yes? I'm a clinical social worker in private practice in Ellsworth, and I got certified with, in Erickson uh, uh, chemotherapy because about 25 years ago I was sitting with a client who was complaining about the warts on her hand, and I kind of poo poo hypnosis, I must confess. Sure. And I said, well, if you want, I've heard that this might work, so let's do it. And we took five minutes and I did a very impromptu hypnosis protocol, and lo and behold, when I saw her the next week, the warts were gone. How about that? And so for that reason, I decided to get certified in it. Mm -hmm. These, these mind-body connections right. really work. Right. I see it in my practice mm -hmm. every day. Mm -hmm. Very important. Oh, that, that's a terrific story. Thank you for sharing that. I think yes. biofeedback took me two times because it was eighty dollars an hour. <laughs> yeah, I can do it with my raynoids. Oh, is can, that right? I can make my hands turn uh -huh. red again within a very short time now because it's relaxation from the shoulders down, and you just think it's a very interesting. That's that's great. Thanks for sharing that. Yes, I wish I could impart it to somebody else, but I don't have that ability. But. Yeah, well, and folks need to come. So you went to that experience with an open mind, and, and you know, uh, you know. So Albert Einstein said it best: parachutes in the human mind, or parachutes are like the human mind. The human mind is like parachute that wor works best when it's open. Yeah. So, so. so she had machines, you know, that mm -hmm. said that. Was, was cool. Well, thank you all again for attending. I appreciate it. Thank you.